Hey, what is up, everybody? I'm here to give you guys a special kind of video today, and um, this is gonna be a great video. Um, and you can tell by the, by the title down below. You already know what the name of the video is, but I'm gonna build up to it anyways. Um, as everybody know, this Sunday at Survivor Series on November 22nd, 2015, if it happens, which I'm leading towards that it possibly will happen, um, will mark the 25th anniversary of The Undertaker's debut. Um, and they're doing stuff really special for The uh, Undertaker. Uh, they're, they're having a celebration for him. They're going to have a 25 years of celebration for The Undertaker, and uh, it's cool. Um, I think it's awesome that they're going to do that. Um, I can't wait to see Survivor Series for kind of that reason, because I want to see what they do for The Undertaker. Because they'll really have an Undertaker go out big. Because I'm assuming he's probably going to retire at WrestleMania 32. That's my guess, um, since it's in his hometown and all that stuff. So um, I think they're sending him out to go out big. He, fin he had his blow-off feud with Brock Lesnar. He wrestled a ton of pay-per-views. He, he went out looking good in shape. And now they're having this celebration. And it kind of makes me sad because um, it's just going to be weird to see the WWE without The Undertaker. He's been there for 25 years. Even though technically he's on a part-time basis now. But you get what I'm saying. It just would feel weird if he didn't compete at a WrestleMania. Because he's been there since WrestleMania 7. And he's had the streak and all that stuff. Um, and it will be weird. And um, it's just going to be awkward. And then, uh, you know, he's my favorite wrestler of all time. I love his mystique. And it's just going to be weird for me to not see The Undertaker. Even though technically I don't see him anyway sometimes. But you get what I'm saying. It's just going to be weird to think that Undertaker will technically never wrestle at le at, in a WWE win ever again. So, that's just going to be weird. Um, so, I am going to do my review and thoughts of the Undertaker week that the WWE put together, they put out so they put out some YouTube some YouTube clips on YouTube and some stuff on the WWE Network that I'm gonna check out. So um, excuse me. Um, so uh, I am going to uh, give my thoughts and review each thing. So uh, I'm not gonna say what I'm gonna review yet. I'm gonna let you guys tune in as as this uh, video goes goes along. So that's so uh, that's it for now. I will be back after I watch some more after I watch some clips about the Undertaker. Okay, so the first one came out on November fifteenth, two thousand fifteen, and uh, this one is uh, in the uh, WWE series called uh, WWE Fury. Now the way you have you can watch this is you have to go on YouTube and uh, put in the search bar WWE. YouTube channel and subscribe to WWE's YouTube channel to find this or you can just you know find the YouTube channel itself because I don't think there's any other way you can watch this besides on YouTube and maybe I think you can watch it on uh, WWE.com as well and um, this is put and uh, what WWE Fury is it just shows a move set um, from a wrestler or it just shows a move set in general or it shows like a big spot, like somebody going through tables, somebody getting hit with a chair or something like that. And it shows um and it shows like the best moments of those or just moves that happen in those. I usually like to do like big impacting moves with that. And uh, it usually likes to show it in thirty seconds or less. So this one, uh, so that for this week's episode, they did something for the Undertaker since this was Undertaker week. And um this one is called 21 essential Undertaker moves. Um, and this pretty much showed any one of Undertaker's patented move sets. Um, and, in, and in this, it showed uh, the Tombstone Pile Driver, the Choke Slam, the Last Ride, the Apron Leg Drop he likes to do, and that dive that he likes to do that he normally does at uh, when, when he's wrestling at WrestleMania. And um, that's really all it shows. I'll talk about a few highlights that it showed in here that I liked. I like the one that he showed when he was when he tombstones Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 26. Uh, I like the last ride that was the tombstone. I like the uh, last ride that he did to. Uh, there's two last rides that I like that he did. I like the last ride that he did to Christian, um, and I also like the the last ride that he did to Spike Dudley through the trash can. And then um, for the choke slams, 
I like the choke slam that he did to um. Oh no! Another last ride I like that he did is I like the last ride that he did to Rey Mysterio on SmackDown. I also liked that last ride as well. Um, like that was that one was like the one that he did to Rey Mysterio on SmackDown was like back in uh, two thousand three. I really liked that last ride, and um, for the choke slam, I like the choke slam that he did to Chris Jericho on Raw, and um, I also liked the um, what else did I like besides um. That's about it. Uh, I, but they, it has a lot of good move sets. Totally check it out. I'm, I'll post it in the description box if you want to check it out. But like I said, the, the other way to check it out. So I've just given you my review of that. Now I'm gonna go on and review the next thing. So I hope you guys enjoyed the, that part of the review. Okay, so the next thing for Undertaker Week came out um, on November sixteenth, two thousand fifteen, and uh, this is part one. Of uh, Legends with JBL. There's like part 1 and part 2 of this. And I'm probably going to review um, both parts. Uh, I'm just going to watch. I'm going to watch one part. Then review it here. And then I'm going to review the other part. Um, when I watch it. I've already watched this part though. So I'm going to review it now. Um, and this one is called. Undertaker's Rivals. Even though technically they talked about them. But um. They talked about other things other than just rivalries. Um, and this pretty much was a panel talking about the untold stories of uh, The Undertaker's career. And uh, they had some great people on the panel. They had the host, obviously, JBL, because uh, it's called Legends of JBL. Wouldn't make any sense if he wasn't hosting it. Then we had um, Stone Cold Steve Austin. We also had Shawn Michaels and Triple H. I'm assuming this was actually like taped on the law when they were all there when they when they were all there for that like that legends law uh, a few months ago. Uh, that's just what I'm assuming, and um, it was a good segment. They just they pretty much just talk, sit down and talk like me and uh, all of my friends do on the uh, Massasoit Wrestling Corner, but you you can check out right up there. Um, they, they just pretty much sat down and talk about the Undertaker. Um, and there's some things that I uh, didn't even know about The Undertaker. Um, so obviously they talk about his debut at Survivor Series 1990. And um, how um, when he uh, came uh, when he came in, it was like a, a different gimmick. It was a different gimmick in that era because, um, you know, uh, because pretty much all the gimmicks were different in that era. They were all cartoony gimmicks. He was the first ever dead man gimmick. And it was cool. Um, and a bunch of people thought that it, the character was just going to... Um, wasn't going to last that long. It was just going to be one of those characters that shot up to the top really fast. And then eventually he would they would plummet down. Um, and uh, they also talked about how... Um, when uh, he came out, a bunch of people were scared. Not just kids were scared. Even adults were scared. And uh, I thought that was cool. They even... Uh, Triple H even talked about how... They all even talked about, too, how... Um, it would have... Um, it would have just failed on... it. Anybody else... If anybody else had had that gimmick, it would have failed. If, um, if it wasn't for The Undertaker... Like, if Mark Calloway... If it wasn't... Mark Calloway having this gimmick, it would have failed, um, and, uh, I think that t makes total sense, because, uh, he made it evolve, because Shawn Michaels even said, because he, sh he switched a lot, he switched to the, uh, American Bad, he switched from, well, the Dead Man, to the, uh, the newer version of the Dead Man, to the American Badass, then back to the Dead Man, and Shawn Michaels says that normally when you have to switch a gimmick that many times, um, normally what happens is uh, you lose your credibility, but he was able to maintain his credibility with these gimmicks. And Triple H said that he pulled these gimmicks off really well um, with all these times. He even went completely away from the Dead Man character when he was the American Badass Undertaker, and he completely went away from the American Badass Undertaker to the Dead Man Undertaker. It was just really cool. And uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin even talked about how... Uh, they would joke around talking about who would be there longer. And, and uh, in the end of the day, Stone Cold left 13 years ago when Undertaker was still there today. I thought that was cool. Um, 
And he said that uh, JBL talked about how Undertaker was told by Arn Anderson and a bunch of other people when he went to USWA and WCW that uh, the gimmick wasn't going to work, that uh, he wasn't, it, they weren't used properly there. The reason Undertaker's gimmick worked was because Vince McMahon let him take a little bit of control of the character. Um, Shawn Michaels even said that in Triple H. And um, he said that's why uh, Undertaker's gimmick wor worked too, was because he got some control of it. Triple H even talked about it was the times he was able to adjust. Because I think what also made the Undertaker's gimmick work was be was the uh, and th as the more hot technology became to increase, the more that technology became more advanced and allowed Undertaker's gimmick to grow. They kind of talked a little bit of, about that. Um, and JBL asked him, like, during the time when uh, people were jumping ship to WCW um, before the Attitude Era, was, what would have happened if the Undertaker would jump ship? And uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin talks about how they thought they were going to be screwed anyway, like somewhat anyways, um, because they were losing a lot of the top stars. They lost uh, Kevin Nash, they lost Scott Hall, and then they lost Bret Hart, who was the, the WWE champion at the time. And Undertaker was, um, you know, uh, Undertaker was a big part um, of the WWE. He was that he was the guy. He but and uh, they said they would have been screwed if uh, they had lost the under to the Undertaker. And Triple H says that he wasn't. Um, JBL asked him if he thought about jumping, and uh, JBL says he talked to some sort sources. Saying that uh, Kevin Nash tried to get the Undertaker to jump, but he didn't want to jump, and Triple H says it was because of loyalty, um, because uh, any when Undertaker came to WWE, he tried things other pla in other places. He tried things in USW, like he tried wrestling in USWA, like I talked about earlier, WCW, and they didn't utilize him properly. And he knew Vince McMahon brought him straight to the top, and. Um, Shawn Michael and uh, JBL even talks about too how he came to the WWE because um, I think Paul E. Danger Paul E. Danielously talked to Bruce Pritchard and um, said that uh, the Undertaker uh, originally was wrestling a match with like his hip knocked out and uh, when Vince McMahon saw this big guy he wanted to do things with him. And uh, Triple H even talked about how when Undertaker first came in, he would always move really slow. That also brought something to the Undertaker's gimmick that no one's ever done before. And then um, when um, and then uh, Triple H also said that uh, you know Shawn Michaels even said that the, it, it he they made the light move not going back to WCW because they were all originally in WCW first. It's because uh, J Vince McMahon was the only one. That knew how to um, book, you know the, them. They knew how to control them. They he knew how to handle them. They didn't really know how to handle them. And Stone Cold Steve Austin even said that if Undertaker had gone to WCW, um, his career might not have been the same. And that might be true. Maybe his career wouldn't have been the same. You know uh, what would have Undertaker's career been like if he went to WCW and then came back to WWE uh, when WCW went under in two thousand one? What would have happened? I don't know. Um, and then JBL talks about how he had his first match, um, the night after WrestleMania, uh, 12 against The Undertaker, and, uh, he was worried because, uh, he, he was worried that it wasn't gonna go very well because, um, he, uh, had quit working for Japan and stuff like that, and, uh, he went to the WWE, and originally he was doing some, uh, baseball stuff, playing, he was playing, like, minor league um, baseball and for New York, and uh, he said that he wasn't um, planning. Uh, he was planning on just leaving, but the Undertaker, but uh, Zeb Coulter talked him out of it. Actually, he said Zeb Coulter talked him out of it, and uh, when he wrestled the match, the Undertaker carried him through the match, and he says that hanging in there with the Undertaker is more important than winning twenty matches on TV. Um, if you hung in there with the Undertaker and he gave you the rub. Um, you would be instantly, you would stick around and be put and be pushed really big for a while. Um, and, uh, 
Stone Cold Steve Austin talks about a story about how he was supposed to wrestle The Undertaker. And uh, when Undertaker, he knew exactly what he was going to do. And then when Undertaker came to the win, he completely blanked down and forgot everything he was going to do. I thought that was awesome. And I'm not sure if it was when he be became Stone Cold Steve Austin or when he was still the win master. He, does he, he doesn't really remember. but um, And then uh, they talk about how he has this catchphrase where he punches you in the corner. Undertaker will always say, how much... Do you I owe you money? And I thought that was awesome. And then uh, JBL asked Shawn Michaels if um he if uh he got to pick his opponent and why did he pick his opponent? And we find out found out that JBL picked Rey Mysterio to be his opponent in dedication to Eddie Guerrero. Um so I thought that was cool. And uh, Shawn Michaels um says that he didn't get to pick his opponent, um, but the uh, Michael Hayes Michael P.S. Hayes brought up the idea to um, have him work back-to-back -back Mania matches against The Undertaker. Um, and uh, he was said he was happy the way he ended up retiring. So that's how that, that idea was to work back-to-back -back matches and put your career on the line against The Undertaker in the main event of WrestleMania 26. And then um, they talk about WrestleMania 25 when, they ha when Undertaker and Shawn Michaels had that show classic and it was like one of the great matches and um triple h talked about how it was going to be a tough act to follow because triple h was supposed to face randy orton in the main event and uh when triple h was watching that mat and it was going to be like and the storyline was great but then they had to follow that incredible matchup and uh the fact and uh well undertaker even asked like what position they were going on the card and there was like i think at WrestleMania 25, there were, like, about eight matches. They were, like, fifth. And Undertaker says they were, they were going to, like, business. They were going to, like, really go, go. And they really did go. They had the match of the night. And uh, Triple H says, like, when, halfway through the match when Randy Orton comes up, he, he told Randy Orton that they were fucked, which was awesome. And then uh, he JBO asked Stone Cold Steve Austin if, uh, the if the match between Taker and Michaels was the greatest of all time at WrestleMania 25. And Stone Cold Steve Austin said, um, no, um, well, he said, like, it's on one of the great, he says it's on the greatest of all time, but he says you can't really decide the greatest of all time, because you could sit, like, a bunch of 20 wrestling experts, and they, they wouldn't be able to decide, uh, what was the greatest match of all time, um, and Triple H says it's like music, you're always there for the emotion, and you're not really exactly sure what your favorite song is, you're not really exactly sure what your favorite match is. And uh, then they talk about the WrestleMania 28 match uh, the f for the Hell in a Cell match between Undertaker and Triple H. And they really loved that moment and what it meant for the fans to get that moment. Then they start talking about how, uh, wh how uh, when you're looking at it from the other side, as long as you do things right in the match, everyone's going to love it. And um, I love it. And Stone Cold Steve Austin says he even texted Triple H and said, great match. And... Uh, that was pretty much it. They just kind of sat down and uh, shot the shit. So now I'm gonna watch part two. Part one was great though. I really love, I really love like discussions like that where they sit down and talk about wrestling. So I can't wait to watch. So I've I've already seen this anyways, but I can't wait to watch part two again. And uh, I'll be back when I'm done with part two. But part one was very good. It was it's totally worth checking out. But part, let's see how part two ended up. Okay, sorry if I'm wrapped in a blanket, but I'm freezing, so, uh, I gotta be wrapped in a blanket, so, uh, now I'm going to review Legends with JBL Part 2, and this time it's called Legends of Undertaker Rivals, it's called Undertaker Rivals, this is pretty much Part 2 of the, uh, Legends with JBL that I just talked about, the same people on the panel, and now, this time, they talk about how, uh, because in Part 1, I forgot to mention this, but, in part one, they talked about how when Undertaker never broke kayfabe, he always stayed in character pretty much. You can never get him to laugh about anything. You can never get him to crack up. Um, so they talk about that. So that used to be like a running joke to try to do backstage uh, that they would try to do. They would try to get to see if they could get the Undertaker to laugh or break kayfabe. And uh, they've done it a couple of times. Um, Vince McMahon... Booker T and Triple H were getting them due to the uh, Spinner Rooney, as or they called it the Taker Rooney, uh, and this was I think back in like two thousand one, um, and then um, 
you know, then, um, who else, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, um, talks about how, uh, and they were wrestling, like, a battle royal for, like, a tribute to the troop show, uh, they didn't say it was a tribute to the troop show, but they referenced that it pretty much was that, and, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, but, but punched him in the head, and Undertaker, like, sat up like this, and with his hair, and Stone Cold Steve Austin admitted he was hung over, so that made Undertaker laugh, so he had to, like, stick his head back down, and Stone Cold, um, remembers the moment where in SummerSlam 1998, Highway to Hell, when they had the main event match, um, when, uh, Stone, when, uh, Stone Cold kicked Undertaker on the head, and then he, he, uh, his head went up, and he hit Stone Cold's head, and he actually legit got knocked out in the, ma in the match, um, which I, I think I had a feeling because I think I reviewed this match on this channel before, and I did know about that. I think because well, I didn't really know about it, but I, I remember like Stone Cold seemed a little awkward in the match. So Undertaker set up a spot where the Undertaker hit a leg drop off the top rope through the announce table onto Stone Cold Steve Austin, and um, the table would break, and. Um, he set that up just in case that something like that would happen, and he ended up breaking his uh, coccyx bone. And then uh, JBL talks about a moment where he would people would feed him jokes backstage, though, to try to get the Undertaker to break kayfabe, but it and uh, it worked one time. So then, um, what else did they talk about? They talk about a moment too, where like he wouldn't even break character sometimes, and like if uh, he would never really like sell. Like, when he was Mark Calloway, he would, uh, not really sell, like, if he was tired or anything like that. Because the business, they're on the road, you know, pretty much all year. So, they, uh, he talks about how it, he, uh, they were asking each other whether it would be tired or they would wear thin. And, um, he one time laid and took a nap in a, uh, um, one of those caskets. And everybody stood around and to try to get him to the laugh. Because when he would sit wake up everyone would laugh but he just sat up like the undertaker and walked out then he was being like taped up because he got injured ribs and he couldn't even uh wrestle and um undertaker just went when he went into undertaker mode he just acted like the ribs didn't even hurt he even talked about he had he had to wear that mask like in 1993 19 and in, in 1994 because uh he uh hurt his eye i forget what happened away and then and uh, he he hurt one eye and then in 2010 he hurt the other eye and then um, he talked about well, uh, he got third degree burns during his entrance in the at the Elimination Chamber 2010 pay per view, and then um, Triple H talks about that the reason he wanted to come clean to the Undertaker about his relationship with Stephanie McMahon is because uh, he knew he was the right guy, he knew how he would handle it, and he would be calm headed about it. He trusted his judgment the best. So then he talks about how. Uh, he ended up being like the leader of um, wrestling court. Pretty much what that was was um, was uh, if, there, if any wrestlers ever got in a dispute, they would have wrestling court. Undertaker was always the judge of it, and he was the judge because he was the most mature and he was just the locker room leader. Anytime you pissed off the Undertaker, Undertaker just always made those decisions, and. Um, then he talks about too how he never got mad about any angles. He would get frustrated, but he wouldn't get like level headed about it like Shawn Michaels or Stone Cold would. And um, like he even they even point out how he had to work a program with Giant Gonzalez too. So, um, so then um, Undertaker um, they talk about too how uh, what else did they talk about? I guess I could just move on. So then they talk about uh. How Undertaker should be tired. Shawn Michaels didn't really know how to answer it. Triple H thinks that it's not his opinion to give. He thinks that he should make the um, decision whether he decides what program, what match, and uh, just how long he wants to continue wrestling. And then uh, Stone Cold uh, Steve Austin said that uh, he does not really show himself, but he thinks he should get some sort of ceremony or something like that. And then they talk about the streak ending. Uh, before that, actually, they talked about the streak ending and the, how they were shocked. Shawn Michaels was looking at Triple H, and he's like, did that really just happen? Stone Cold was ready, getting ready to drink two beers at once. And when he saw that, he was sh he was shocked. He was like, what the hell just happened? What the F was that? And then um, 
He even says that he understands why, because Brock Lesnar was that guy to take the streak. And um, he understands, and but he just he just personally was a fan of the streak. And uh, Triple H even talks about the fact there was a streak and that no one would ever want the finishers to go in different directions. And um, he says, Shawn Michaels asked, like, when did they decide there was a streak? And I think uh, set, when they wrestled at WrestleMania 17, the streak wasn't even a thing, which I don't think it was. And I think the streak actually ended up becoming a thing when he wrestled Randy Orton in 2005, I believe. I think that's when the streak became a thing, but I'm not sure. Um, JBL even talks about how Michael Cole on commentary was about to say that the streak is uh, continues, but instead he had to say the streak is over. And uh, then eventually, so then uh, eventually JBL asked him, like, how do you want The Undertaker to be remembered? And Stone Cold Steve Austin says he's going to be remembered as the, one of the greatest performers and greatest wrestlers in the professional wrestling. Like 50 years from now, he says, too. And Shawn Michaels says uh, he always is going to have fun coming here. And uh, that's how Undertaker's going to be remembered, always having fun with, like in wrestling. And Triple H says for any wrestler that's wrestled with him or anyone that's seen him on TV wrestle, he says he'll be remembered by uh, respect. And then uh, that was it. And I thought it was uh, a good episode these were really good stuff and i liked it i enjoyed it so uh that's my thoughts there now i'm going to continue with the undertaker week okay so the next thing i'm going to show you is uh another, a segment that you have to be subscribed to wwe's youtube channel to be able to see it's called five things it's a weekly show that they do and if you don't know what it is it's hosted by kyle edwards and he goes over five things that happened in wrestlers. And it's a different, bunch of different topics. It's not just wrestlers, but anything like wrestling based. And since it's Undertaker week, he, he dedicated one to the Undertaker. And it's five Undertaker matches you've never seen before. So these are matches that have never been seen on TV before. Um, and it usually starts from five to one, so that's where I'm going. So number five um, is... Undertaker versus the British Bulldog from Copes Coliseum, November 30th, 1991. And uh, they say that um, when Undertaker won the championship, he only had one title defense, and that's the one he lost a Tuesday, this Tuesday in te Texas against Hulk Hogan. That's actually not the case, they said, though. He apparently he had three WWE title matches against the British Bulldog, and he was successful in every one. So, yeah. Um, hold on, I gotta fix something real quick. Okay, um, and then it says that number two, n number four is Undertaker versus Macho Man Randy Savage from Primetime Wrestling. This was the, like a bonus match that took place afterwards, and uh, this was uh, after that, uh, him and Jake the Snake Roberts pulled that trick on Macho Man Randy Savage and Miss Elizabeth when they, uh, uh, when the present, when they were doing the wedding gifts at the reception party and one of the presents ended up being a snake and then Undertaker hit him off the head with the urn. This is what it is. So then, uh, we have a tag team match. It was the brother that happens. It was the, uh, brother, this is number three. This was the Brothers of Destructions versus Diamond Dallas Page and Dave Batista. And this happened at OVW, um, June 27th, 2001. So, nothing really to say there. Um, and then number two is Undertaker versus Big Show when this happened on, uh, ECW. What at ECW on July 18th, 2006. Now, this one is actually false. You actually, th this match actually did air. This is when ECW came back in 2006. So I actually went and watched the match, and I'm just going to do a little review of the match. So it was uh, this match, and Big Show was the champion. Defend, defend, de Big Show was defending the ECW title against um, The Undertaker. And the reason that the match was happening was because on Saturday night's main event, um, Undertaker, Big Show challenged Undertaker to this match. And then uh, un and uh, this was when Undertaker was feuding with the great Kali, so Big Show was kind of intervened in it. And uh, on Saturday night's main event, Undertaker and Big Show both double... No, no, Undertaker and the Great Khali... No, I'm sorry. Big Show and the Great Khali both double chokeslammed the Undertaker. So we get the match. It actually was kind of um, a solid match. Uh, the beginning's really slow, though. It's just a lot of um, it's standard stuff. 
And uh, Undertaker keeps trying to knock down Big Show, but Big Show keeps overwhelming him. Big Show hits a big booty and he dominates Undertaker for a while. And then eventually, uh, Undertaker, they, fi they start fighting on the outside. Undertaker hits a boot in the side of the head while Big Show's on the apron. Undertaker starts working over the leg of Big Show. And he gets him in a heel hook, but Big Show gets to the ropes. They both try to choke slam each other, but they fight out of it. Um, and then uh, Big Show super hits a superplex on Undertaker. And then uh, Big Show tries to go for a uh, sleeper, that big sleeper that he likes to do. But Undertaker counters it with an old school, which was cool. And then he clotheslines him. No, he big boots him outside the win. And then the great Kali comes out. And uh, Undertaker starts fighting with Kali. And uh, then he bounces his head off the steel steps. And uh, Big Show and Undertaker and the great Kali keep trying to attack the Undertaker. So the Undertaker wins because Kali attacked him. So Big Show ended up retaining the ECW Championship because the title can't change hands off a count or a disqualification. And Undertaker just starts wailing on everybody. He grabs the steel chair and starts hitting both Big Show and uh, the great Kali. And he starts tearing apart the announce table. <laughs> and he tries to choke slam Big Show through the table, but then the great Kali comes in, and Kali and Big Show double choke slam Undertaker through the announcer's table, and then that was it. So, uh, like I said, solid stuff. Wasn't a huge great Kali fan, but whatever. So that was number two, though, was the that match. And then uh, number one um, was Undertaker versus Ric Flair, um, and this happened um, at Coliseum. Home video on September 2nd, 1992. Ric Flair was the heel in the match. He was defending the WWE Championship against The Undertaker. Apparently, he came this close to winning. And uh, he uh, was about to win, but then uh, Mr. Perfect attacked him. So it was a disqualification. So, you know, titles can't change. He has to uh, count out to disqualification. So there it is there. So uh, that's my thoughts on that. I usually like watching Five Thins, so it's cool to watch that. But uh, other than that, I'm just going to continue on with this uh, Undertaker Week reviews. Okay, so now I'm going to review Undertaker's Gravest Matches. I think it's supposed to be like Greatest Matches, but they, instead they say Gravest Matches. Um, but that's fine with me. So um, I'm just going to talk about this. Um... Now, I did watch this a couple of days ago, so I remember it fresh. I was originally just going to watch each match and then uh, come on here and talk about it. But there's no need to do that because um, I watched it a couple of days ago. So, And I don't want to be up too late staying up and watching this again because I had to do that Thursday and then we didn't talk about it on the Master Story Wrestling Corner. That's why you're getting a whole Undertaker Week video on it. So uh, let's talk about it. So any time it was kind of like a documentary a little bit too because they had that creepy lady uh, that says a lot of Undertaker stuff um, about um you know uh, what about who his opponents are facing and these are the gravest matches because these are all his gimmick types so um and I'm gonna try to explain why each match is happening too um. So we get the first one that they showed. It was uh, Undertaker with Paul Bear uh, versus Kamala with Kim She and Harvey Whippleman win side. And this was a casket match. And uh, this match happened at Survivor Series November 24th, 1992. Uh, I don't really know why the match was happening. I know they were having a rematch from SummerSlam 92, I think. And um, it was a disqualification. So then here they just had a rematch and it was a casket match. And uh, it was the first ever casket match in WWE history. And uh, yeah, it was good. Uh, the match itself was alright. Um, I liked watching The Undertaker. Like What I liked about the first version of The Undertaker is you could do a lot of stuff to him and he would, he would be um, invincible. You couldn't hurt him. Uh, it was tough to hurt him. So I liked that. Um... Undertaker dominates in the beginning, and then Kamala starts to, like, dominate a lot. He beats the shit out of him, throws him into the steps, bounces his head off the two steps. He hits him in the spine with a chair, and, um, then eventually he hits, like, three splashes on Taker, and then he gets hold of, uh, the Undertaker's urn, and then, um, 
that, that Paul Bear carries went inside, and then Undertaker grabs the urn, hits behind the referee's back, and hits it off the head of uh, Kamala twice, and covers him and gets the win. Because he actually had to pin him before he put him in, a cas in the casket. And then he puts him in the casket and nails it shut. So that was fine there. I thought it was good. Um, so then we get another match. It's Undertaker versus Mankind with Paul Bearer inside in a Buried Alive match. I think this was the first ever Buried Alive match in history. And this match happened at In Your House Buried Alive um, on October 20th, 1996. Um, so I was like barely even a year old when this match happened. Um, so, um, yeah, so, um, the reason this match was happening was because the night after WrestleMania, Mankind made his debut to the WWE, and he attacked The Undertaker, and then, um, they had a match at Kin of the Wind, which you can check out that review up here in that episode of the Massasoit Wrestling Corner, and Mankind won by making, by choking out The Undertaker with the Mandible Claw, and then they had a, a, a rematch, it was a Boiler Room, boiler room Brawl match um, at SummerSlam, and then every, something happened that we thought would never happen, Paul Bear ended up joining forces with Mankind, he turned on The Undertaker, and um, so then I will hear, and Undertaker wanted to bury Mankind alive, so then uh, they had their match, I liked it, it was awesome, they ended up brawling around Windside, it was great. Um... Undertaker hit a dive right off the ropes, I remember. And they they had to... The way you win the match is pretty much literal. You have to bury your, oppo your opponent alive. And, um... So then, uh, they attacked... So when they stop brawling, they just brawl all over the place. Um, Mankind hits Undertaker with a shovel. And then, uh, they fight into the crowd. And Undertaker... And they, when they get back up to the win, Undertaker dives right through the... Right off... Right off... Right... Right over the crowd, right back, and like into the um, arena, um, which was cool. And then um, eventually, mankind takes control, and uh, Undertaker throws him into the steel steps. Um, and then uh, mankind hits him with the uh, steel chair off the head. And then um, Undertaker and um, mankind ends up getting like some sort of weapon and starts hitting the Undertaker with it. And then the Undertaker. Uh, Throws him into the steel steps, and then um, they both stop. Mankind had him in a sleeper hold while they were on the grave. They both started rolling down the grave, and then uh, Undertaker hit Mankind off the head with the steel steps. And then eventually, after Mankind even even dominated by having a nerve hold in the match, and then he put him in the mandible claw. And then uh, Undertaker tombstone Mankind. He fireman carries him up to the grave, and then Mankind hits him, does a ma the mandible claw. Um, Near the grave site, then Undertaker fights out of it. Choke, he gets Undertaker choke slams mankind into the grave, and he starts burying him into it. And Undertaker wins because technically he did bury him alive. I guess they couldn't have him do it all, the whole way because it would have taken too long. Um, and then eventually he continues to bury mankind. Referee is trying to stop him. They attack. He attacks him, and then um, somebody I don't know who this guy is because I've never seen him before. Um, hits Undertaker in the back in the head with a shovel, so he gets knocked out. So mankind, this guy, and Paul Bear start burying the Undertaker in the uh, into the in the grave, and then uh, superstars come out to help. We saw Gold Dust, who had a history with Undertaker, um, Hunter Hodes Helmsley, and um, a bunch of other superstars. I didn't really see who else. And uh, they start. They just bury the Undertaker into the grave. You hear ba Paul Bear saying, "Oh yes, he's gone. The Undertaker is gone." So then Lightning strikes the win, and then uh, Undertaker's hand comes up through the grave site. So and this is a one of my favorite Undertaker moments. I loved it. It was awesome. So then uh, that was the match. Totally check it out. It's the, I would I would say it's like their second best match. It's an awesome match uh, that I've seen, anyways. So then. Um, we get the next match. It's Undertaker versus Kane with Paul Bearer inside. This was an Inferno match. The way you won this match is you had to set your opponent on fire. And this match happened at Unforgiven on April 26, 1998. <coughs> and uh, the reason this match was happening was Undertaker was still feuding with Paul Bearer. And um, any person that Paul Bearer tried to throw at the Undertaker failed to take him down. And we found out that there was... a um, 
that uh, Undertaker burnt his family down. They, they used to live in a funeral home, and Undertaker and Paul Bear accused Undertaker of burning the fa- funeral home down. And uh, he had a brother named Kane, and then um, the Undertaker says it didn't happen like that. It was all just an accident. And then uh, Paul Bear tells Undertaker that Kane's still alive. And then at Hell in a Cell, uh, they're in the Hell in a Cell match with Shawn Michaels at uh, In Your House Bad Blood. Undert- uh, Kane ripped the Kane f- made his debut, screwed Undertaker out of the match. And then uh, you th- Undertaker never wanted to fight his brother Kane. And then um, Undertaker um, finally had to do it because uh, Kane at the Royal Rumble um, put Undertaker in a casket and lit it on fire. So technically Undertaker was gone from this point. Then he made his resurrection. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about that now because I'm going to be ta- I'll be talking about it anyways later on. What happened was uh, Kane uh, wanted to do like a Paul Bear wanted to do a respect to Kane to the Undertaker. And he actually ended up, a, Kane, he had Kane go get the belt, and uh, Kane ended up assault, assaulting a fan. He tombstoned him on the floor, which was awesome. He was obviously a plant fan. So then he went to the well, they told the bell ten times, and then he tombstones the timekeeper. And he, Paul Bear says that he, he still has this one tombstone left in him. He's taking out everybody. He wants somebody to come out and take out um, Kane. And then we hear, um, we see the caskets in the wind. Lightning bolt strikes the casket, and Undertaker sits up. Well, actually, it strikes The Undertaker, and then um, he has, like, a clip-on mic or something. I don't really think they had those back then, but he has some sort of mic where he can just talk without having to use one. He can hear him, and he says that he is back, and he says, Welcome to hell. Was that the best you could talk together to take me out? He's disappointed, and um, Undertaker says that uh, he's... And Kane tries to... has fire goes down, but Undertaker walks through the fire, and he says, I will walk through the fires of hell to face you, Kane. And he says that um, he challenges him to a match at WrestleMania. They have the match. Obviously, Taker won, so he went 14-0. and But then uh, Kane wanted Undertaker to face him one more time. And then Undertaker had an interview segment saying that uh, what you did at WrestleMania um, was impressive. And then Kane had smashed his parents' graves. You can obviously tell they were fake, though, because right when he smashed them, they just broke. And then he lit them on fire. So then we get the match itself. Good match. I thought the Mania match was better. Um, it was a unique concept. Anytime that somebody would do like a superplex, which happened in the match, the flames would shoot up, which was awesome. And then um, Kane choke slam the Undertaker. Undertaker choke slam Kane. They do double big boots, double clotheslines, sidewalk slam by Kane. I thought it was a solid matchup. And then eventually, uh, Undertaker Kane tries to go off the top rope, but then Undertaker big boots him, so Kane ends up falling outside the ring, but there's no way that Undertaker can get out because the flames are right there. So then uh, Kane leaves, goes to leave, but then Vader, who had, Kane had taken out before, at, comes out and attacks Kane, and they stop walling. Then Undertaker dives on a Vader and Kane, and then um, Undertaker and Kane continue to brawl, and uh, v- Paul Bale, who was a accompanied Kane, who accompanied Kane to this match, hit Undertaker on the back, and Undertaker no-sold it, and then Undertaker hit Kane off the head with the steel chair, um, and then Undertaker starts stalking Paul Bale, and there was this, uh, um, um, like, uh, drum set out there that was there for a band, and Undertaker hits Paul Bale off the head with a drum set, and then he hits him right in the gut, right in the hook with the, uh, microphone, and then he goes back to the win, and that was, like, that was a little. That was the payoff to that because Undertaker had finally gotten his hands on Paul Bear. Then Undertaker walks back to the win, starts brawling with Kane, and then Kane's arm gets set on fire. So Undertaker wins. I thought it was a good match, and I really liked the concept. It was unique. I thought it was good. And then I've already covered the two other matches. It was Undertaker versus Edge in a Hell in a Cell match, and this match happened at SummerSlam on August twenty seventh, two thousand eight. I'm not going to cover that match again. And then the other match uh, is between Undertaker versus. Triple H in a Hell in a Cell match with Shawn Michaels as the special guest referee. Um, And that match happened at WrestleMania 28 on April 1st, 2012. April Fool's Day, if you didn't know that. And I'm going to post the link to the Undertaker Edge match up here and the Undertaker Triple H match down there. And uh, yeah, those are all the matches and I'm going to continue with this Undertaker week. Okay, I know this is late as hell and I know Survivor Series... For 2015 is about to end in like an hour. 
But I'm going to finish out this Undertaker week, and then when I'm done uploading this video, I am going to uh, watch the whole Survivor Series. What happened with this video was the internet in my house was... My mom's house actually was being a dick, so uh, I couldn't upload any more videos. And another thing is I kind of started to feel sick a little bit, so uh, I wasn't really feeling making the video. So I'm going to finish this video, and then I'm going to watch Survivor Series. Um, and I just watched uh, Jim Johnson, I think is his name is, and he talked about how the Undertaker's theme song was created. I figured this is important to tell. And uh, he's like, well... He, he he figured that, uh, you know, a death is supposed to be sad, so that's why Undertaker, because he didn't know what to make of it. If, it. if it's someone you can't see, somebody, um, but no, he, but then they told him what it was, and then, uh, he started with the, p with the piano notes, and then, uh, he made the bass and the organ, and you really have to see it, but it's really awesome stuff, um, and then, uh, it's awesome, so check, make sure to check out that video. I'll post it in the description box down below. Okay, so the other ones were um, when uh, Santino was pretending to be him at like a, at the SmackDown party. I actually went to the SmackDown. Um, shit, I forget again. When Triple H did the Tombstone Power Driver at WrestleMania 27. And um, I think that's it. That's about it. I, I think that's it. Um, and then... Uh, it shows a bunch of super people, celebrities, wrestlers, sitting in the Undertaker's theme song. The New Day killed it. Xavier Woods was playing the trombone as Big E and then Kofi Kingston sat up. It was awesome. And they were like sitting up and uh, Big E with his voice really makes it perfect. Renee Young was doing it. Uh, Jimmy Uso and Naomi was doing it. We had, um, they were pretty good at it. The Vaude Villains were great. Um... Chad Gable and Jason Jordan were great. Then who else did it? We had some foot. We had some uh, football players and some uh, basketball players doing it. But I don't watch uh, any other sports, so I don't know. Um, we had uh, Sasha Banks doing it. We had uh, Enzo Amore, um, John Stewart and his son. So it was you got some people in there, um, and it was uh, pretty good. And Tom Phillips was doing it. Um, and then, um, it, I watched a video, um, saying, where were you, where the streak was broken, and, uh, Kevin Owens says that he was, um, up on the balcony, and he looked at his friend, and they were both shocked, and the, out of all the 20 years that Kevin Owens has watched wrestling, that was when his jaw dropped the most, and they, t and, uh, Sasha Banks just couldn't believe it. it's gonna be something that sticks over with for the rest of her life, um, Dean Ambrose um, was talking about how it was a moment where everybody lightened like this. Chad Patton, who refereed the match, says he was it was an honor, but he still it's, he said that it didn't feel right for him. Stone Cold Steve Austin, but I already talked about that earlier in the video. Uh, Seth Rollins says that it, it, he thought it would be something that never happened after he was after he had won so often. Uh, JBL, but we are, I already talked about JBL's take on it. Um, uh, yeah, a bunch of people. I think I was about it, JBL, and that, that's about it. But, uh, yeah. So now that I've done that, uh, I'm just going to review Survivor Series, and then I'll be out of here. So I'm going to start it now. Okay, so now I'm going to do my review of Survivor Series 1990. Um, I did this show, obviously, because this is where The Undertaker debuted, so I figured I'd review the show itself. So I'm going to review it. Let's, go let's do it. So we had Gorilla Monsoon and Rowdy Roddy Piper on commentary. I think Rowdy Roddy Piper is actually amazing on commentary. I think um, I I watched uh, I think SummerSlam 1990, I believe, and uh, he was commentating on that show, and he was amazing on that show too. So I thought it was great. Now I got to mention that there was a lot of Survivor Series match on this show because that's how it used to be back then, and I miss I wish they would be like that now. Um, and um, um at ev and uh. There was there was four of them, and there was going to be like an ultimate Survivor Series match where uh, whoever was the sole survivors in the other Survivor Series matches on the show would all go into this Survivor Series match, if that makes sense. Um, so let's get into it. So we have t the Perfect Team. They actually had names for this team, and the Perfect Team was uh, captained by Mr. Perfect and uh, D 
He had Demolition on his team, the whole Axe, Smash, and Crush. And they were accompanied by Mr. Fuji and Barbie the Brain Heenan. And they wrestled the Warriors, um, which was captained by Ultimate Warrior. And they wrestled the Legion of Doom um, and the Texas Tornado. And at the time, Ultimate Warrior was the WWF champion. And at the time, the Texas Tornado was the Intercont was the Intercontinental champion. And uh, this was obviously a fi- and this one was a five on five traditional Survivor Series match. There are Survivor Series matches, but some of them don't aren't five on five. Some of them are four on fours. Uh, I think the rest of them after this are four on fours, except for one match. But I'm I I could be one. So uh, I thought this was a solid matchup. Let me go over the eliminations, and I'll try to. So the Warriors team dominates for a while, and um. Axe um, gets p- um, gets eliminated by the Ultimate Warrior after a Warrior Splash after 3 minutes and th- 23 seconds. So then eventually the match breaks down into chaos. Um, the Legion of Doom and uh, Smash and Cross are just start brawling. And they, don't get it, then the, they end up getting disqualified for brawling inside the win um, after 7 minutes and 36 seconds because the referee lost control. Another reason is because... Um, one of them, was sh- I remember somebody shoved the referee too, so. So then it was down to Mr. Perfect in a 2-on-1 handicap match against the Texas Tornado and Ultimate Warrior. And Texas Tornado actually took the Intercontinental Championship from Mr. Perfect at SummerSlam, so that made sense. And Warrior and Perfect were kind of starting a feud too, so. Um, so then Mr. Perfect eliminated uh, the Texas Tornado after a Perfect's Plex, and this, and he, and this was, at, and this, he eliminated him. Uh, and Miss Texas Tornado got eliminated um, in 11 minutes and 2 seconds. So then it came down to uh, Mr. Perfect and the Ultimate Warrior. And uh, they actually had a good cl- matchup here. And Mr. Perfect dominated the match for a while. And then Warrior made his comeback. And he eliminated him after hitting the Warrior Splash. After 14 minutes and 20 seconds. And um, the sole survivor was the Ultimate Warrior. So he's one of the guys that's going to be in that main event Survivor Series tag team match later. Um... So then, um, next the, uh, Million Dollar Team gets interviewed. I'll go over who's in it because it's the next match. Um, but the Million, Do- and, uh, the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, who's the captain of the team, because they don't have a tag team partner, they have a mystery partner. And, uh, he says that they're gonna get a mystery partner, and he cuts a promo on Dusty Rhodes, because he was feuding at him at- with him at the time, because, uh, he had taken, uh, Sapphire from Dusty Rhodes, he bought her off, which was pretty racist by WWE, um, and yeah, so they, this led to the Survivor Series match, so we, let's get to it, we had the Dream Team, um, it was captained by the American Dream Baby, Dusty Rhodes, and his, and his team members were Coco Beware and the Hot Foundation, and the Hot Foundation were the, uh, WWF Tag Team Champions at the time, and, uh, then, and they wrestled, obviously, the Million Dollar Team, uh, which consisted of Will- Rhythm and Blues, which consist and that tag team consisted of the Honky Tonk Man and Greg the Hammer Valentine, and um, it was obviously captain, like I said, by uh, the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase and a mystery partner. Um, now, if you don't know who the mystery partner is and you watch wrestling, you're an idiot because uh, you don't just because it's pretty obvious. Um, but I'll tell you anyways. So this. Was the date was the debut of the Undertaker? Well, he didn't really debut on this show. Um, I think I heard somewhere that he actually wrestled a couple of matches, like dark matches on like superstars and stuff like that. So he did. So he didn't debut on this show technically, but technically they say he did debut on this show. So, you know, um, and uh, you know, Ted DiBiase gets uh gets on the mic, introduces Undertaker as his tag team partner. And he gets uh, managed because at the time he was managed by Brother Love. And Undertaker, obviously, like I talked about earlier in the video, what uh, you know, what Triple H, Shawn Michaels, and Stone Cold Steve Austin were saying about his debut earlier. But honestly, I it's awesome to see Undertaker's debut. He looked like a force. He did look like someone you would be scared of. And when you do look at him, you do think that it's a gimmick that you that wouldn't last as long. Um, it would be like a gimmick where it would last about maybe like a year and then it would kind of fizzle out, but it ended up lasting for 25 years. This debut was so good that Undertaker tonight is having a bit, but is currently right now having a pay-per-view built around him, which is awesome. Um, so I thought that was cool. So yeah, they also get a limit. So 
the all he but uh Blood of Love was in the corner of Team Million Dollar Man, and so was Jimmy Hart because he was the manager of uh, Rhythm and Blues. And uh, let's talk about the match itself. So um, Undertaker looked like a machine in this match, by the way. Um, uh, so they keep trying to take down The Undertaker, and Coco Beware gets eliminated by The Undertaker after a Tombstone pile driver. Um, and, th and this was after a 1 minute and 39 seconds. And then uh, the haunt and uh, the Jim the Anvil Nyhart comes in and he just punches the Undertaker a couple of times, and he just tags himself out and doesn't even affect him. Um, and then uh, the Honky Tonk Man gets eliminated by Jim Nyhart after a power slam after four minutes and sixteen seconds. Um, and then uh, Jim Nyhart gets eliminated by Ted DiBiase b because uh, Virgil pulls him up, pulls him, up, trips him on the outside. And this was after five minutes and forty nine seconds. So then it comes down to um. You know, so then it comes down to a tag team match, Dusty Rhodes, um, and Bret Hart versus The Undertaker and, uh, Ted DiBiase. No, and Greg the Hammer Valentine, too, I forgot about him. And, um, Dusty Rhodes is trying to take down The Undertaker, and Undertaker pins him after a double axe handle off the top rope and after 8 minutes and 28 seconds. And Undertaker continues to attack him, and Brother Love attacks uh, the Dusty Rhodes on the outside, and Dusty Rhodes tries to go after him, but Undertaker just beats the crap out of him, and Undertaker ends up getting counted out after this, so he gets eliminated in 9 minutes and 17 seconds, but still, great debut, Undertaker, they made Undertaker look really strong, and he, he, anytime he was in the match, he owned the match, he dominated the, the, the match, and also, um, they, uh, then also, uh, he didn't get, like, pinned or submitted, he got counted out, so I thought that was a nice way to get eliminated, and so then it's down to Bret Hart versus Greg the Hammer Valentine and um, Ted DiBiase. And uh, well, at this point it was a 3 one but now it's a 2 one one And Greg the Hammer Valentine tries to put in the figure four leg lock on Bret Hart, but Bret Hart rolls him up with a small package after 9 minutes and 57 seconds. So then it comes down to Bret Hart and the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase. And they have a good exchange. Bret Hart ends up diving on the outside. He ends up doing a superplex in the win, and Bret Hart just really takes it to uh, the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. They made Bret Hart look strong here. Then eventually, Bret Hart hits a reverse flying cross body, and um, Ted DiBiase rolls him over for a pin, and uses his momentum to roll him over to a pin, and he gets the pin full, after, and Bret Hart gets eliminated after 13 minutes and 54 seconds. So Ted DiBiase was the uh, sole survivor, so he's going to be now in the main event. And uh, I thought this was a solid matchup. This is actually my favorite match of the night in Wing Rise. And also because it had The Undertaker's debut, my favorite wrestler of all time. So I thought this was good. Um, I liked it. And, um, you know, it was good. So then, um, what else? Um, what was I going to say? And they also made Bret Hart look good in the match. Because I think af around after this time, Bret Hart started to... After this year, Bret Hart uh, um, ended up becoming a singles guy, and he became, like, the top guy in the company a, a few years. He became, like, Intercontinental Champion and WWE Champion. So, I thought this was good. Uh, totally would recommend watching that match uh, because it builds stars. Um, so, then the next ma the next thing is the Vipers get interviewed, and I'll go over who's in, the who's in that team. Uh, the, Vi the Vipers get interviewed, and uh, they talk about how they're going to take down Rick the Mono Martel. And then uh, let me talk about that match. Uh, i got to find it real quick. Uh, I don't think I have this match on my notes, but to be honest with you, though, I think I screwed up here. Because I accidentally put the... Uh, so i got to actually find it online. So let me just give me a second. Survivor Series 199. Let me just look it up online real quick. So, we get that match, though. Um, It was a good... And uh, the reason this match was happening was... uh, Jake the Snake Roberts and Rick the Mountain Motel were feuding. Who else was feuding? Because I think there was other people feuding in the match. No, no one else was really feuding. But it was really them because... Uh, and they, they turned it into a Survivor Series match. Um, And I really like Rick the Mountain Motel when... um. He was, um, you know, um, I really liked him when he was in this role. I liked him in this model role. He was awesome. Even though I didn't see it, but you get what I'm saying. Um, and the match was good. 
Uh, Marty Jannetty gets eliminated after a power slam after five minutes and three seconds. And um, Jimmy Superfly Snucker gets eliminated by an inside cradle um, by Rick Martel after nine minutes and 28 seconds. So then it's down to Shawn Michaels and Jake the Snake Roberts versus the entire team of the Visionaries. Because I, did, I didn't even go over who was in the team. I forgot to do that. Let me do that now. So who, the people that were in the team, it was the Visionaries, which consisted of the Captain Rick the Mono Martel, Power and Glory, which consisted of Hercules and Paul Rama, and the Warlord, versus the Vipers, which consisted of Captain Jake the Snake Roberts, the Rockers, which you should know who's in that tag team, and Superfly Jimmy Snucker with Slick Winside. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. I think I mistyped that. Um, yeah, I mistyped the Slick was actually in the, the, the Visionaries wins corner. So then eventually, um, it comes down to Shawn Michaels and, uh, Jake, Jake the Snake Roberts versus the Visionaries. And Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, he can't really see out of his eye for some reason. I don't remember, I don't know why, but, uh, I think he got sprayed in the eye with something. Um, and, um, Shawn Michaels gets eliminated after a power suplex. It was when, it was when, uh, it was when um, Hercules would do a suplex and Paul Walmart would do a splash. And then um, it comes down to Jake the Snake Roberts versus the entire Visionaries team. And Jake the Snake Roberts hits a DDT on s somebody. But then uh, Rick the Martel gets in there and tries to hit him with... I forgot, he tried to hit him with a weapon, but I don't remember what it was. And uh, then the Jake the Snake Roberts grabs a snake and he chases after Rick Martel. And he ends up getting counted out, so the entire team survives because Rick of the Mono Motel wasn't the legal man. So the entire team survives. The whole visionary. So now they're in trouble. So now whoever is going to be on the other team is in trouble because now they also have the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase on their team. Which I wonder how they would they set that up though, like if how they would set up uh they uh how they would set up like who's going to be on each team just because the heroes in face. I thought that was weird. Um, but I thought this was good, and, uh, it, it was cool, this was the first time that they, an entire team had survived a Survivor Series match, it was cool, um, then, uh, the Hulkamaniacs get interviewed, I don't really remember what they say, I think they say they're gonna take down the natural disasters, so then, um, we get the nat, and the, we get, and these are all four on four Survivor Series matches right now at this point, so then we get another four on four Survivor Series match, it's the natural disasters, Captain by Earthquake, um, and they also the other members are Dino Bravo, Dino Bravo Haiku and the Barbarian with Jimmy Hart and Bobby the Brain Heenan inside versus the Hulkamaniacs, Captain by Hulk Hogan, and the other team members are Tugboat, Hacksaw, Jim Duggan, and Big Boss Man. I I enjoyed this match; it was good. Let me go over the eliminations. Um, um. Haiku got eliminated by uh, Big Boss Man after a Boss Man slam after 3 minutes and 15 seconds. Um, Superfly, uh, Hacksaw Jib Duggan got disqualified after hitting Earthquake with a 2x4 after 6 minutes and 12 seconds. So then Hogan slammed Earthquake and he tried to uh, eliminate him but it didn't work. And Hogan acted like a heel in this match, like a lot. He uh, ended up... Um, like, doing a lot of heel tactics. Like, when Earthquake would try to do something, he would get big booted. It was by Tugboat, and then uh, he would pull him outside the win. It was weird. So then Dino Bravo got eliminated by Hulk Hogan because he was getting the heat on him after a small package after 7 minutes and 59 seconds. Big Boss Man got eliminated by Earthquake Earthquake after an elbow. Earthquake and Tugboat got eliminated by a double countout after 11 minutes and 33 seconds. This was when Hogan pulled him out, so then it came down to Hogan and the Barbarian. And Hogan eliminated the Barbarian after a leg drop, which we everyone saw that coming in 14 minutes and 49 seconds. So then, um, continuing, um, then Macho Ken Randy Savage gets interviewed and he says he's coming after Ultimate Warriors WWE Championship, well, WWF title at the time. Um, so then we get the, uh, Alliance team versus, um, team, um, Versus the missionaries, the alliance team consisted of was captained by Nikolai Volkov, Tito Sant. The other members of the team were Tito Santana and the Bushwhackers, and they wrestled the missionaries, which was captained by Sergeant Slaughter, Boris Zukov, and the Orenton Express, which consists of Sato and 
Tatanka, and they were managed by Mr. Fuji and General Adnan, and if you don't know who General Adnan is, that's the Iron Sheik, and um, this match made its storyline sense, because Nikolai Volkov just converted to American, and Iron Sheik converted to Iraq, and he cuts a Iron Sheik, and, uh, not Iron Sheik, well, Iron Sheik, yeah, but also Sergeant Slaughter, and this is where they went did that big whole storyline before he won the title and stuff like that, and I thought this was a nice solid feud here, a reason to have a match, and Sergeant Slaughter cuts a promo talking down, praising Iraq and talking down the Americans, and, um, I like this, um, so then, um, let me go over the eliminations real quick, I'll just do it on the, let me just find it real quick, um, so Hulk Hogan, by the way, was the sole survivor and hit the Hulk Maniacs team, and so he's gonna gonna be, he's rest teaming up with Warrior. I forgot to mention that. Um, so Boris Zukov got eliminated by Tio Santana after a flying forearm after 48 seconds. So then uh, Sato got eliminated by Butch after a battering ram. After 1 minute and 46 seconds. And Tataka got eliminated by Tito Santana after a flying form after 2 minutes and 13 seconds. So Sergeant Slaw is by himself. It's just him versus um, the Alliance. Which is weird because in 2001 then they have the Alliance for WCW. I actually forgot to mention that. Um, and now they have one. They had one like years later. Well years earlier. Um, and years later. they um, So Sergeant Slaw actually eliminates... Nikolai Volkov with a elbow drop after 5 minutes and 25 seconds. Then he eliminates Luke after a gut buster after 6 minutes and 30 seconds. And then he eliminates Butch after a clothesline after 6 minutes and 53 seconds. So then uh, a bunch of chaos ensues. The referee takes a bump and it's down to Slaughter and Tito Santana. And uh, Gemma Adnan comes in and hits um, Tito Santana with a flat with the IWAC flag. And Sergeant Slaughter gets him in the camel clutch. However, the referee sees it, so he gets disqualified, and after 10 minutes and 52 seconds, so Tito Santana's the sole survivor, but they made Sergeant Slaughter look really strong, like he was a force to be reckoned with, and I like that they didn't have him get pinned, because it wouldn't have made sense, and you needed to have this team win, because, um, then, um, you know, um, the Hogan and Warrior would have been just left by themselves in a tag team match, so I thought that made sense to have somebody, have him get another member. So then, um, and I forgot to mention, too, that Ted DiBiase has a WWF title match the next night. That's why he ended up being the sole survivor on his team, because they probably wanted to build him up a little bit. So Ted DiBiase and Team Visionaries talk about how they, Hogan and Royal don't have a chance of beating them, and that, um, Hogan and Royal probably aren't going to get along after what happened, after they wrestled at WrestleMania 6 earlier this year, and I thought that was good. So then, uh, then we get another segment. There was this egg um, Windside, right? and, uh, everyone was wondering, like, what was in that egg, and when the egg gets hatched, it's the debut of the Gobbly Gooko. Yeah, and if you don't know who played the Gobbly Gooko, it was Hector Guerrero, and this was bad. Mm. It was bad. Um, no one liked it, everybody booed, and, uh, it was bad, and originally, it's actually a good thing. It was a Hector Guerrero hindsight, though. I mean, technically, it kind of sucked for him. But they were actually originally ha going to have The Undertaker be the Gobbly Gook, and he probably would have been the Gobbly Taker. Um, and if you imagine if they had The Undertaker play the Gobbly Gook instead, then who knows where the WWE would be. Um, but he dances around with Mean Gene Oakland. It was bad, and it was just bad. It was bad. Um... I can't be and uh, I can't believe they went with this. I think they scrapped it after a while, but yeah, it was bad. So then uh, Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, and Tito Santana get interviewed, and they talk about how they're going to overcome the odds. So then we get the big um, Survivor Series match. It's uh, Ted DiBiase and the Vi and the Visionaries with Slick and Virgil inside versus Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, and Tito Santana in a grand finale match for in a grand f f finale match of Survival. It's a three-on-five Survivor Series elimination match. Well, traditional. And uh, let me go over the eliminations. Um, the Warlord was eliminated by Tito Santana after a flying forearm. Um, 
Tito Santana was eliminated by Ted DiBiase after a hot shot after a minute and 51 seconds. This makes sense, though, because Tito Santana was just in an exhausting Survivor Series match, so I was fine with this, and it made sense storyline-wise. It also made sense because you want to build up Ted DiBiase to get elimination, and I knew that we're going to get Tito Santana out of there, but whatever. Paul Walmart got eliminated by Hulk Hogan after a clothesline after 5 minutes and 55 sec 57 seconds, sorry. Rick Martel got eliminated, got counted out when he just when he just left the match at the seven minutes and seventeen seconds because he was getting his ass kicked. Ted DiBiase gets eliminated by Hulk Hogan after a leg drop at, at eight minutes and thirty seconds, which didn't really make any sense because you would want to build up your number one contender, but it's Hogan, so you know whatever. And then uh, Hercules gets eliminated by a Warrior Splash in nine minutes and seven seconds, so Hogan and Warrior are the sole survivors. That made sense. Um... They went to the two guys the company was being built around, and I was fine with that. And that was the end of the Survivor Series. I did like Survivor Series. I did think I was kind of disappointed with this match, though, because I expected it to deliver more. I, I still enjoyed it, but I expected it a little bit better. Match of the night, though, was definitely uh, team, the Million Dollar Team versus the Dream Team. I liked that match. It, the Survivor Series is good, though, because it had the debut with The Undertaker, the gobbly, the gobbly Gooker, which was bad. But still, it still was a moment, I guess, in Survivor Series. I liked the uh, first tag team match with William and Perfect. So, I liked the Survivor Series. It was a good show. Um, and then, uh, to close out the Undertaker week, because that's why I reviewed this show, was because Undertaker debuted on it. Uh, it's, it's still a good show, though. Um, so, um, Undertaker week is now a close. I'm going to now watch Survivor Series, and then technically it would be a close when I review it tomorrow on the Master Sorry Western Corner, which you can check out there to subscribe, well, to check out on the playlist. And now that's it. Um, I still can't believe 25 years ago, Undertaker debuted, and he became a big superstar. Like I talked, like the whole reasons I talked about throughout this video, um, and it's awesome. And, and uh, he's my favorite of all time. Some moments that they didn't mention was his match with Batista at WrestleMania 23. His feud with Edge. I like that feud. Uh, some of the other stuff with Kane. When they would become a tag team as the Brothers of Destruction. Um, and he's just great overall. Undertaker's like one of... If I had... He is the most respected superstar in my opinion. Because he's... He battered his body for 25 years. He's probably lasted the longer in the wrestling business. Um... But anyhow, that's pretty much it for my video. I'll probably talk about this more tomorrow on the match. So it was the one I just want to go watch Survivor Series right now. So that's pretty much it, guys. Well, pro probably what I'm going to do for Survivor Series, in case you guys are wondering that are watching this, is I'm probably going to watch some of it tonight, and then I'm going to watch it to um, tomorrow um, morning. I'd like, I'll get up early and watch it. And um, if you want to check out some other stuff, you can check out up here my Owen the Talkinator channel. I made a video talking about my thoughts, talking about the uh, Paris attacks. Hopefully that didn't happen tonight. Then down below you can check out the um, my CM Brothers channel. I ended up doing a SmackDown review on that channel. You can check that out. Um, it, it's the most recent episode of SmackDown. Um, and then over here you can check out my friend James the He-Man Hebert's channel. Uh, one is called James Hebert because he has two. One's called James Hebert. And if you want to check out something, you can check out his Five Finger Death Punch. It's awesome. And then uh, over here, you can check out uh, his Raymond Youth Wrestling channel where he's holding a tournament to crown the first ever WIW champion. And I'm one of those people in that tournament. I'm going to win the whole thing. And that's pretty much it, guys. You can click down below to subscribe to me as well to check out the Master Sawyer Wrestling Corner tomorrow. And that's pretty much it, guys. Talk to you later.